Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, and innovators. My name is Hermann Holland. I'm the managing director of the think tank Skapakraft, which for the second year in a row is co-hosting this event together with Civita and Oslo Innovation Week. As the leader of a think tank based on Christian values, I believe that it is of fundamental importance to keep and transfer some core values to the next generations of entrepreneurs in order for us to stay competitive. These values were evident in Norway's perhaps most important entrepreneur in the development of our modern society and economy, Hans Nelson Hauge, who in the early 19th century laid the foundation for the growth of Norway into what our country is today. They include courage, honesty, hard work, and long-term thinking for the gain of greater society. These are vital in order to both stay competitive and increase our innovative cap capability in the years to come. We in Skopelkraft have the privilege of collaborating with Civita on certain topics where we find common ground, including on this book, Entrepreneurs Build Norway, which, by the way, you can pick up free of charge as you leave today. Today, we are thrilled to welcome you to discuss and compare ourselves to a modern innovation miracle, that of Israel's entrepreneurial model. We would therefore like to thank the Israeli embassy as well for their help in making today's breakfast meeting a reality. As renewable energy, inevitably, will be more and more important in the years to come. We as a nation increasingly will have to make shifts into new ways of creating economic value. The bottom line is this we will have to increase our innovation capability. One of the most inspiring books I've read on the subject over the past years has been this one, Startup Nation by Dan Center and Saul Singer. It is therefore my privilege to present our keynote speaker this morning, Saul Singer, who's an American Israeli journalist and co-author of Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle. He's also former editorial page editor at the Jerusalem Post. Mr. Singer will be joined by Daniel Rasvidal, CEO of the Federation for Norwegian Innovation Companies in Norway, and Anita Kuntraset, CEO of Innovation Norway. With these words, I would like to hand over the rest over the meeting to one of CIVITA's fellows, Eirik Lekke, who will guide us through the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Hamann. Always a pleasure cooperating with uh, Skapa Kaft. In just a few seconds, I will give the floor to Saul Singer. But before I give the floor to Mr. Singer, let me outline the practical details. Saul Singer will speak for about 20 minutes. Thereafter, Daniel Asvidal and Anita Toset will give their comments. After the panelists finish their introduction, we will op open up for Q&As. Uh, upon taking the floor, we ask you to introduce yourself and speak up, since we do not have a microphone. And I need to emphasize, as always, we're opening up for questions and short comments, not additional speeches. So we ask you to be brief and proficient. I am aware that there are many people sitting in the back. I will uh, notice also you. And if you want to take the floor, please give me a sign and I will register you on the speaker's list. And since we do not have a microphone, I will repeat, repeat the questions and comments so that everybody here can follow the dialogue. This meeting will finish no later than 9.30, and I kindly ask you to stay seated until then, unless it is absolutely necessary to leave prior to the end of the meeting. Last point. We also urge you to use social media, a great innovation by the way, and the Twitter hashtag for this meeting is Civita Focust, but do remember to turn your mobile on a silent mode. So much for the practical details. Mr. Singer, it's honor. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's great to be in Oslo. It's a little bit cooler here than it is in Jerusalem where I live. We're still in t-shirts over there. Um, my kids uh, couldn't believe that it was the three degrees here, but uh, it's actually quite nice weather. and. Um, it's, uh, it's my, my second time here in Oslo, uh, but I, I really wish I would have a little time to, to travel around and see, see this place. Um, 
But um, so I want to talk about Startup Nation, but I actually, what I really want to do is get into what happened after Startup Nation, after the book, because the, the book came out about five years ago. And um, you know, Dan and I were uh, hoping that it would do well in the US. We were really happy that it became a bestseller there. And you know, we thought we'd spend a couple months uh, speaking about the book, and that would be about the end of it. And then something very surprising happened. Surprising to us, we didn't even think about it. It started getting translated, uh, first in Bulgarian, and then Chinese, and Italian, French, German, uh, Turkish. It's coming out in, in Arabic. Uh, I got my first email from Mongolia uh, saying uh, we, we really want to become a startup nation. We want to translate your book. Uh, and you know it's out now in about 27 languages, and there's still a few more coming. And and I started traveling. Actually, I started following the book around the world. And um, so instead of two months, I've actually been doing this for the last five years. And um, this has been a fascinating education for me about the nature of innovation in the world, and this strange thing that that countries all over the world see some relevance to what's going on in Israel. Because, you know, our story is, if you read the book, you'll see, and as you can imagine, a unique story. Um, we, our story was about overcoming adversity. Uh, we're, we're a tiny country with no resources till recently, uh, in a bad neighborhood, and, uh, and, you know, our story was about overcoming this. In fact, you know, the truth is, even though Norway is about, I don't know, 20 times in, uh, Israel's size, you're actually a small country like us in, in population. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's actually, you know, one of the things we talk about as, as a, a disadvantage being from a tiny country. Um, uh, but Israel turned it into an advantage. Uh, we're not only tiny, which means we have no local market, uh, but we're cut off from the regional market. Uh, so because of that, we had to think globally from day one. So that's you know, just a small example of, of turning a, a disadvantage into an advantage. And I think you'll find, the more I travel, the more I think about th these things, that every, every country has its baskets of strengths and weaknesses, advantages and disadvantages, and often these, these strengths are also weaknesses and vice versa. So the, the example of being a small country uh, is a perfect one. The example of being a rich country is a perfect one. You know, there are advantages to being poor, there are advantages to being rich, and there are disadvantages to each as well. Um, and, uh, and this is what's going into how every country is basically now trying to build its own innovation ecosystem. So I want to say something, though, about an insight that I think comes from Israel about the nature of innovation. And that is that we have a, a kind of misconception about innovation. And you can see this because if you put the word innovation into Google Images, you do a search for pictures of innovation, what you'll get is lots of pictures of light bulbs. Um, and that's because the light bulb is the symbol of the idea. And we think of innovation as ideas. And the problem with that is that, you know, innovation is not really ideas. The idea may be one small part of it. But I think that ideas are pretty well distributed around the world. There's really a lot of smart people everywhere. There's a lot of great ideas everywhere. What makes the difference is what, do you, what does it take to turn an idea into reality, into a startup, into a company, into an innovation? And so the key ends up being what you add to the idea. And I think the Israeli experience shows that there are two big things you have to add to ideas. The first is a lot of drive and determination. And the second is a willingness to take risk. And our story has been Basically, the book is, is, when you boil it down, is where did Israel get 
a little bit more of those two extra ingredients to add to ideas that allowed it to produce more startups than anywhere outside of Silicon Valley. Um, and just, just to give you an idea, uh, um, I mean, what a great asset you have here within a, a direct flight uh, from Oslo. During the summer only, I'm told there's a direct flight from Oslo to Tel Aviv. Um, uh, maybe we can do something about that. Um, but uh, not only is there, are there more startups in Israel, let's say about 4,000 venture-backed companies in Israel producing another thousand every year. Of course, that doesn't mean it's growing like that. A lot of them are disappearing at the same time. Um, uh, we've got you know, a few hundred big R&D centers of big companies, you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, IBM, you know, and so on. Uh, these these R&D centers are, a lot of times, they're, they're composed of the startups bought by that company, like IBM bought you know, more than 10 companies. Cisco bought more than 10 companies. Um, and that becomes their R&D center. So there's, you've got this kind of massive ecosystem there, and it's getting two and a half times as much venture capital as the United States, about 30 times as much on average uh, more than Europe. Um, that's probably changing, but you know, roughly speaking. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so the question is where Israel got more of those two ingredients. And I'll just go very quickly through these things because but, but you're going to hear these things and you're going to say, well, that's not Norway. <laughs> what is that? How does that apply to us? And, but what I think is so interesting about this story is, is how everybody needs to do it their own way and can do it their own way. So when I talk about Israel's story, it's not necessarily Norway's story or anybody else's. Um, but our story was about overcoming adversity and where did you get those two extra ingredients? And the first place we got it was that the whole country is a startup. What does that mean? Israel started with an idea. Like, you know, it was one of those ideas. It was a crazy idea. If you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea and you start talking to people about it, everyone's going to tell you it's a crazy idea. Guaranteed because all good new ideas sound crazy to most people, or otherwise someone would have done them already. Okay, so that's the first step. Uh, so you start with a crazy impossible idea, and it takes a lot of grit and determination and willingness to take risks to make that idea a reality. So Israel itself is a startup like that. And you know, our kids, we have three kids, three girls. Um, our oldest is 18. So she's now just graduated high school. She's in a kind of gap year, pre-Army gap year program. Um, a lot of her friends are already in the Army, uh, and she's going to be going in in about a year. Um, men for three years, women for two years. And this has been another huge factor for us, um, basically culturally, because in, in Israel, in most places you have two stages in life. You have school and you have work. In Israel, you have this third stage in life called the army that everybody does, uh, where you learn things that you don't learn in school, you don't learn in work. Things like leadership, teamwork. Um, you know, when you think about, uh, we're talking in the, in the car, and uh, um, two of the people with me both had spent some time on a kibbutz in Israel, volunteering. And a lot of actually Norwegians uh, uh, and people from other countries have done this, you know, m many years ago. Uh, and, you know, what are, what are they doing when they're doing that? I mean, it's this experience of, of, of doing something beyond yourself, doing something important uh, in another place with a, another group of people. This idea of sacrifice, this idea of leadership, of teamwork, this is something that, this is an experience that Israelis get in the army. It's not a natural experience. You don't get it in school. You don't get it in work. And it's actually very important for entrepreneurship. And, and this is actually important for Norway as well. And the reason it's important for entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship is really hard. 
you know, it's, it's, anybody who's going into it has to say to themselves, why am I doing this? There's an easier way to earn a living than being an entrepreneur. You've got to be motivated, I think, by something more than money. In fact, the ones who are, who are kind of the lifestyle entrepreneurs, I think they're going to drop out, usually, because they're going to hit obstacles along the way. It's going to be difficult. And the ones who are just in it for lifestyle or because they think it's an easy way to earn, earn a living, they're going to drop it. Uh, and the ones who are going to make it are the ones who are, are really passionate about building something that they think is important for them, for their country, for the world. Um, and for that, you have to have the sense of mission, the sense of sacrifice. And that's what Israelis actually pick up in the army, mainly. And also through scouting and all these kind of quasi, you know, preparatory things that relate to, that kind of prepare young Israelis to go in the army where uh, they're going to have to, and they're going to need those things. Um, so that's been very important for us. The third thing, a uh, factor, so I mentioned the fact that the whole country is a startup, the military experience. The third big factor for us has been that we're a country of immigrants. And that's been really important because, you know, like if you look at Silicon Valley, half the companies there were started by immigrants. Uh, why is that important? Immigrants are natural entrepreneurs because they have those two factors. They um, were driven enough to move from one country to another. They took a big risk when they did that. So they have those two additional ingredients, naturally. So it's not surprising that immigrants in many countries are the entrepreneurs. There's this huge association between immigration and entrepreneurship. And Israel is a country where uh, almost everybody, like I did, I immigrated to Israel from 20 years ago from the US. Almost everybody came there uh, themselves or their parents or their grandparents. Um, so it's a country with an immigrant ethos that works very hard at absorbing immigrants, which is an important thing as well. Um, so that's, that's the Israeli story. Uh, how many minutes do we have in the? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. OK, so I want to get into, though, kind of how how this has become universal and what some of the lessons are from my travels and seeing all these different countries. Um, what I see going on in the world, and this has actually happened since the book came out in the last five years, is that, you know, let's say just five years ago, there were only really two kind of major startup ecosystems in the world. There's Silicon Valley and the sort of, you know, American satellite thing. And then there was uh, Israel, you know, which uh, startup nations sort of started coming up about 20, 25 years ago in the early 90s. And, uh, and you know, it's become quite mature and large, not as mature and large as Silicon Valley, but again, the second two. Um, and in these past five years, Startups have been coming up just about everywhere. And, and this is amazing. I, I could you know, tell stories about the different countries that I've been to. And, and it's you know, developing countries, it's rich countries. Uh, and, and generally speaking, what I find is everywhere I go, there are startups. And, and nobody knows that they exist <laughs> in the country. And nobody knows that they exist outside the country. So they're in, they're in what I would call stage one of an ecosystem. Stage one is you've got startups, nobody, and, and you're just like, hello, we're here. Where's the venture capital? Um, <laughs> uh, there's no venture capital. Uh, and you're not known as, as an innovation hub that's attracting either local people to set up venture funds or international venture funds to come. So first comes startups, and there's no venture capital. The next stage is you get your first high-profile success stories. Um, you know, let's say uh, a Skype in Estonia or uh, Angry Birds in Finland. I know that's not the name of the company, but we think of it Angry Birds. Um, uh, in Israel, uh, a classic story that we tell in the book is of a company called ICQ that had uh, a chat program that had millions of users, one of the first 
programs to go viral over the internet in the 90s before there really was much of an internet, the, you know, before Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, suddenly started going viral. Um, and uh, AOL bought this company for $400 million in, I think, 1998 uh, at a time when it had no revenue. So this is a classic bubble story. Don't try this at home. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, you can't do it anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but what happened was everybody, Israelis saw this and they said, oh wow, look at these guys, they're in their 20s and $400 million, you know, those idiots can do it, I can do it. And so this was a huge signal inside the country. Entrepreneurship is maybe something I should do, A, B, outside the country, people said, well, AOL bought this thing for some real money. Maybe we ought to check out what's going on in Israel. There's something going on there. So these first high-profile success stories are critical to shining a spotlight on what's already going on and brings the whole system to the next stage. And the next stage is basically just a, a deepening and maturing of the system and you start attracting more talent, more capital, venture funds, and so on. And so, you know, Israel is you know, deep into this third stage, uh, and many countries around the world are basically in the first stage. And here's my, my key message to, to you, and that is don't do this alone. The way I think the key to you know, getting to that second and third stage, getting those first high profile success stories, getting to a place where you're seen as a, a, a place where innovation is going on that attracts more, that creates this virtuous cycle. Um, you know, the whole cluster theory of Michael Porter and how Silicon Valley, you know, created this vir virtual cycle. So you, you need to get to that critical mass where you start growing. How do you do that? The way you do it is you don't do it by yourself. I mean, maybe uh, five, ten years ago, we were in a world where you had to do it by yourself. But now, every country is doing this. But we're all doing it by ourselves. I mean, it's crazy, especially in Europe, that all these, you got these mini proto-ecosystems in every country in Europe. Um, and, you know, I was, uh, I spoke at a conference in, in Croatia, in Zagreb, called Startup Croatia. And uh, by the way, every country I go has a startup blank name of country, you know, uh, has that kind of organization. And, um, and you know, there, there was full of uh, people, entrepreneurs from different European countries, and some of them were saying, why don't we do this together? Why, why don't we combine our systems more? And uh, there was a guy there who was running an incubator or accelerator in Estonia. He said, in Estonia, most of the accelerators, uh, a lot, most of the startups are not from Estonia. And, and yet, most of the Estonian startups, many of them go outside of Estonia to, to, to build their startup. So you have this flow going on. Uh, and this is, I think, what Norway needs to work on. Uh, I'm just guessing here, because you know, I got here a few hours ago. I'm not an expert at all in Norway. Um, but. Uh, but I think it's really something we all need to do. In fact, Israel needs to get much better at this. We need to, to stop thinking about this is something we need to do by ourselves. We need to combine the strengths and assets of different ecosystems. We need to think, particularly I think in the European context, of how do we leverage the fact that we've got you know, a, a, a tremendous diversity of cultures, of strengths, of weaknesses across Europe, right? people right next to each other. So back to this uh, Croatia thing, I met there some, a founder of a company called Monolith. Uh, the founder was from Croatia. The company was based in the Netherlands. He had founders from the Netherlands, founders from Estonia and Croatia. And he said, you know, this is something like the third startup he did and the most successful. And he attributed his success to the fact that he had founders from these three countries, each of which he wrote me, I asked him, what, what were the strengths of these different founders? And he could say, well, the people from the Netherlands, they, uh, they were better at this. And people from Estonia, they were better at that. People from Croatia, they were better at that. 
And that's just how it works. Different people have different strengths. That's why we form teams, when we form startups. Different countries have different strengths. We need to be forming teams across countries. And uh, I think that's a key. Uh, and that you have ways here in Norway of playing on that asset uh, uh, of accelerating that kind of profit process if you decide that that's what you want to do. So I'm going to leave it at that because I would love to have some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Singer. Daniel Vidal, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's a privilege to be able to join this uh, discussion. Um, first of all, a great presentation of the book. Also, it's a, it's a great read. I, I read the book during the last weeks and uh, really enjoyed the mixture of uh, documentary, storytelling, and history lesson. And I actually thought, uh, felt that I learned a lot of new things that I didn't know before. Uh, so in my commentary, I will comment both on your book, but also I had a really interesting meeting earlier this year with uh, Mr. Avi Hassan, who's the chief scientist of um, Israel. Uh, and that translates basically that he's kind of a, um, a leader of an organization which is like Innovation Norway and the Research Council and uh, SIVA, the Industrial Development Corporation of Norway, all in one. So I'll get into the innovation policy side of things as well. Hi. <laughs> While there are many things to learn from Israel's innovation and entrepreneurship policy, there are also many cultural features that can't be copied as easily, uh, which has, has to do more with history and society than it has to do with politics. And as we all know, culture eats strategy for breakfast and maybe politics for lunch. <laughs> And also, we should keep in mind that uh, the industrial structure of Norway is quite different from Israel, uh, meaning that typical high-tech and R&D intensive sectors such as ICT, biotech, medtech, uh, um, which are actually prominently featured in, in the economy of Israel, are not as important to the uh, Norwegian uh, economy yet. Uh, and because we have a, um, a great contribution from oil and gas, maritime and fishing and more resource-based industries. Um, uh, but there are also some similarities. One thing that I actually didn't know uh, or had, ha, had not reflected upon uh, before reading the book is that uh, when the wall came down in Israel, or in the world, or in Europe actually, uh, a lot of uh, um, the Russian Jews moved to Israel. There was a huge immigration and these uh, Russians were a large number of them were really well educated and you know, people like engineers or, or uh, doctors or scientists. So all of a sudden you had this uh, kind of problem that you had to absorb all these people who had great skills. At that moment, uh, a startup nation like, uh, like today. So the first thing they did in, uh, in Israel was that they opened up uh, tech transfer offices and incubators and all these things, but it didn't really work at first because they you know, they just sat there with the RDs and they tried to develop new products, new innovations, but there was no ecosystem surrounding it to, to, uh, to build up uh, and actually take, take things to market. Uh, so, uh, therefore, I will focus on what they did, which I think is really relevant and interesting in the Norwegian context. context. Um, so, the kind of uh, analysis that was made by um, the financial uh, minister of finance in Israel was that they lacked uh, venture capital. Uh, and also they lacked kind of the business skills needed to take this globally from day one, like you said. So they uh, implemented a scheme which is called the YOSMA, YOSMA program, Pro probably not pronouncing that right, but it means uh, initiative in Hebrew, it says in the book. Um, so what they did, they kind of constructed this in a very clever way because they uh, wanted to get influx of um, international capital, and mainly American capital, I would guess. Uh, and uh, so they had to have a, a partner from Israeli bank or um, institutional capital. They had to have uh, kind of Israeli venture capital actors in the learning, uh, basically. And also uh, they had to have an international partner. In that way they secured that they would learn how to kind of build up this uh, venture capital industry and also attract foreign capital. Uh, and the lesson from the JOSMA investment program, which was implemented in the early 90s, 
is that a substantial public investment made at the right time in a fertile environment uh, actually can spark a self-sustained and private uh, venture capital industry. The initial investment of $100 million made in 10 venture capital funds between 92 and 97 by the Israeli government was matched by private capital. But the real allure of the scheme was the potential upside for investors built into this program. So each fund contained an option for buying out the state share uh, after five years at a good price, given that it, this was a su success. Uh, but there was, a little, there was little downside for the government since all initial costs were paid back plus interest rates. So the state you know, didn't get rich from this, but they didn't lose money. And they also uh, kind of gave the uh, impulse of starting up a new financial industry, which was expert, had expertise in, in investing in the early phases in innovation, uh, innovative company, companies. Um, and uh, what happened was that all 10 funds were subsequently bought by private investment investors who since then have continued to invest. But the difference is that the original 10 Josma funds now manage $3 billion. <laughs> you know, so one hundred million, I mean, it's like a 30-fold um, um, increase in scope and uh, impact. Um, so this of course, it's to the benefit of hundreds of Israeli tech companies every year. Uh, but the real winner is probably the Israeli society, which has restructured its economy in a more knowledge-intensive uh, direction. It's, it has increased the tax base, and uh, it has created hundreds of thousands of jobs in knowledge-intensive and global, born global companies, which is not, you know, which is really fascinating. I mean, uh, actually, Israel is the country in the world outside of uh, the states with uh, the most, uh, the highest number of companies on the Nasdaq uh, technology uh, stock market, which is like. Should not be possible, but it is. China, China has more, but we're a little smaller than China. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, the JOSMA scheme actually kick-started the Israeli venture capital industry, which today is a world leader in itself. So, what is the lesson for Norway here? I mean, given that Norway has a well-functioning uh, venture capital industry in the late stage, both on the private and the public side, but seriously lack competent private capital in the early stage, we should learn from the design of the JOSMA scheme and implement a scheme specifically aimed at the phase after the public grants from Innovation Norway, but before the seed funds and private venture capital industry, uh, I would say roughly in the interval between 1 and 15 million NOC. Um, uh, and also, there are other things to, to learn. Uh, as I mentioned, I had a meeting with Avi Hassan from the um, Office of the Chief Scientist. It's a public body. Uh, uh, and as I said, they, they have basically the responsibility for the ecosystem, innovation, R&D in, in Israel, except for not basic research. Uh, they run the incubator programs, the tech transfer offices, and, and all these things, all the programs for them. Uh, and his background was interesting as well, because he, of course, was a venture capitalist <laughs> as well. Um, um, and he was, uh, he was very clear on a number of things. Um, among them, that his mission uh, as a chief scientist was to push the ecosystem for innovation always further, you know, test the limits. Um, and he specifically emphasized the need for experimenting with policy in initiatives continuously, and then quickly learn and reiterate, much as a startup would do, actually. And he actually, you know, referred to that in our meeting, that they kind of throw out new ideas, they try them, and then, okay, it works, mm, tweak a little bit, and push some, uh, some more money in that direction. So it's, it's an interesting way for a public body to work as well, I think. In, it, uh, in order to do, uh, do so, the OCS uh, always works, works very closely with the private sector. And having a tight and effective partnership with the private sector is seen as a catalyst that creates f far stronger impact than what the uh, chief scientist and his office can manage alone. Also, they also always place really tough demands on performance on all private organizations that they cooperate with, such as incubators, tech transfer offices, and early stage uh, fund managers. It was also quite clear on that once demands have been met, they monitor performance and give long-term funding and significant funding to incubators and others, so they can focus on building great companies instead of chasing money most of the time. Uh, this is also an important lesson for Norway, which in the past has done the opposite, weak funding combined with short-term programs without proper performance indicators. Uh, and all that, I hope, hopefully, is about to change when it comes to investing slightly more in, in top uh, performing incubators, even though funding per top incubator is nowhere near the 15 to 20 million knock put into each top uh, Israeli incubators. So they really work, uh, have a different kind of um, framework to work within. Um, uh, 
And by the way, the cash goes to the entrepreneurs, not the incubators. Uh, the incubator managers and partners uh, create value for themselves by owning parts of the incubator companies. So lesson two for incubation specifically, invest substantial amounts, amounts over the long term, monitor performance, kick out the ones that don't deliver, and let the incubators decide for themselves which profit model to operate with. Uh, uh, and I also have a few other lessons. They are actually not my own, but I, um, uh, I got some uh, really good, great insights uh, from um, emailing a bit with Rotem Schnur, uh, which is sitting over there. He's an, uh, thanks. He's an Israeli uh, professor working here in Norway with entrepreneurship at the University of Agder. Uh, and his comments what, to what uh, Norway could learn from Israel uh, is really interesting as well. Uh, he thinks that we should create formal incentive mechanisms for global companies to set up R&D centers in Norway much more actively than we do today. I mean, we have examples of that already today, but we should do it more actively. Uh, and the reason for that is that working in that, those types of companies is, is, is like a training ground for entrepreneurs uh, that can leave those companies later, maybe work with them as a first customers and, and all these things. Uh, the other thing he said uh, is that we should relax employment laws uh, for young companies to lower their initial costs and also uh, in line with uh, what Mr. Hassan said, tightening the collaboration between Innovation Norway, the Research Council, the industry players and entrepreneurs. Uh, also, he, he recommends to step up, step up efforts on the cultural side, uh, such as Oslo Innovation Week, where we are today, spreading positive me media attention to, uh, to the role model uh, that uh, entrepreneurs can play in renewing and improving society. So, to wrap up, I think that Norwegian innovation policy should be much more bold and ambitious and also more in tune uh, with the private sector. Having said that, the government should also monitor the performance delivered by these uh, cooperating private organizations, uh, whether they are research institutes, incubators, TTOs, or early stage funds. And they should ramp up the money to the ones that deliver. So if we never challenge one another and reward quality, we will have a really hard time developing ourselves at the pace uh, needed in the global innovation race. And on that uh, happy note, I thank you for all uh, for your attention. Thank you, Daniel Vidal. Uh, Anita Tosset, please, the floor is yours. I don't, I don't think it's on. Am you done? Just let me check. <laughs> Some, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, it's on. It's a girl, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for coming to Norway and, and share um, the story with us because. Um, I want to share with you the three key ways that we take from your book. And then uh, I want to reflect before we do that. But the obvious three key takeaways is that there is more to innovation than cash. Uh, the dialogue uh, and the topic in Norway is a lot about as long as we get more money, we'll fix it. I think that's a key issue for us. Secondly, culture is key. How you describe failure how you just don't talk about failure, but you actually accept failure. Uh, culture is not only king, culture is queen, culture is everything, it eats everything for breakfast. Um, number two, key takeaway three, the ability to not only build networks, but capitalize on networks, opening up for foreign investments. We are afraid of foreign money. We are afraid of having international investment into our companies. When, when uh, our startups are being sold, it's a disaster for Norway. It's a failure. So it's a culture uh, thing. Uh, and then uh, part of the culture part is also the brand. So what is the brand of the Israeli nation? The startup nation. What is the brand of Norway? So it's the self-esteem on our ability to actually be successful in startups. So these are the three key takeaways from reading um, your book. But first, I just want to share some um, high-level reflections. Um, Israel is a very interesting case for the Norwegian innovation policy development. So the two countries have a lot in common, while at the same time we're having very different innovation systems. So, Yes, we're comparable of size, 
uh, were also comparable of um, that our economies are productive, meaning uh, we are producing together a lot of health, uh, wealth. So from an economic point of view, both countries must be considered success stories. And also both represent small markets that need to export a lot in order to pay for our welfare expenses. Um, but again, it, I think it's a fair guess that the success in both cases are caused by an advanced ability to develop relevant competencies, either though it's different. But when you read the research and innovation uh, statistic, this is not immediately apparent because uh, the EU Commission has an overall objective for Europe to invest 3% of GDP, and I think we should challenge that too, um, in research and development. And the Norwegian government also has this as a goal. And again, I think we should challenge that. At the moment, Norway invests 1.65% of uh, GDP in R&D below the EU and OECD averages. But the corresponding number for Israel is 4.4. And according to the statistics of the figure in 2007, it was a mind-blowing 4.8%. These numbers do not tell the whole story, however. Uh, these statistics are, not, are designed in such a way that they give more weight to research-based innovations activities and so-called high-tech industries. High-tech industries consist of companies that invest much in R&D as a percentage of the total turnover. And Israel has a lot of research-intensive high-tech companies. Norway has an industrial structure dominated by natural resources and industries that invest less in R&D, regardless of where they are in the world. They, we innovate by other means. So Statoil is considered in this as a low-tech company. Statoil is not a low-tech company, right? Um, so indeed, we have, um, we have found that uh, the Norwegian industry is also knowledge intensive. Uh, like Israel, we have a highly educated workforce with a great ability to adapt to changing framework conditions. Therefore, the Global Innovation Index put Norway and Israel side by side, number 14 and 15. Um, so I think that uh, Norway and Israel um, clearly demonstrate that there are more than one road to wealth creation. Norway is also built on a culture that values learning and knowledge. The tradition goes all the way back to the Reformation in the 16th century, when the kings decided that the welfare of the country depended on the country's ability to satisfy God. The Danes and the Norwegians were to become exemplary Christians, and for that to happen, they had to be able to read the gospel. An unintended consequence of this policy was that the union produced a large number of people who had learned how to learn and how and were therefore able to thrive under changing conditions. A large number of Norwegian sailors became captains in the Dutch fleet because they know how to read. A similar but in no way identical uh, development is the found in the Jewish history. Jewish mystics also valued reading and learning. And the Kabbalists believed this learning was essential if they were to serve God and in that way save the world. The stereotype of the intellectual Jew has some root in reality. In Europe, the Jews were normally excluded from farming the land. The alternatives were often trade and thinking. So the lack of natural resources combined with a strong learning culture made a high-tech strategy a sensible strategy for Israel. There is therefore a strong focus on research-intensive manufacturing. Uh, the excess of natural resources combined with a strong learning culture led Norway into the opposite direction. We needed to develop the advanced competencies needed to harvest and develop natural resources like petroleum and fish. But these industries do not have to be high-tech in the Israeli sense of the world, of the word. And I just want to quote you before I come to my three points. Um, in your book you write, um, that the Israeli success must be something broader and deeper. You say, it must lie in the stories of individual entrepreneurs like Shai Agassi, which are emblematic of the state itself. 
As we will show, it is a story not just of talent, but of tenacity, of insidable questioning, questioning, of authority, of determined informality, combined with a unique attitude towards failure, teamwork, mission, risk, and cross-disciplinary activity. So the three things, more than cash, you have been very generous when it comes to funding schemes, but you also providing that there is more to a well-functioning ecosystem than cash. And you refer to the Josh Learner setting the table. I completely agree. It's more than cash. And also in Norway, we do have seed capital funds, but we're, more, we're talking more about the funds than actually the results of the funds. So how many of you can mention companies growing up being well familiar from the first funds? Because the focus we have is we want more money to have new funds. And we don't even remember the startups. While you are nurturing, you having focus on, on, on the entrepreneurs and the companies coming out of the funds. We have very concern in Norway about we want the funds to be very high. Your funds are lower. You have a fund uh, which is lower than $50 million. We have a lot higher funds than that. So I think the focus of funds is challenging. Um, also, um, uh, you are referring to uh, Josmas, um, main of attracting foreign venture capitalists. We're afraid of foreign capital, aren't we? No? We, we shouldn't be, but I'm thinking, talking about the elephant in the room. I don't know. Culture is king, being small and aiming big. We are similar in size and we can learn from your, from your mindset. We are five million people. We need to do as Israel. We need to take the, what differentiates us from the other countries and really be strong building on that. Yesterday we had the president of India here. It's obvious that the Indian market is interesting for Norway. It's not that obvious for India how interesting Norway is to help them becoming uh, number one um, economic uh, uh, country of the world in 2050. We need to be extremely clear on who we are, how we can make a difference, and how we can make India do that turnover. Then we need to, to uh, agree on how we need to build our national brand. Uh, secondly, team spirit. You say it's okay to, to, to fail. You say in Israel to do a startup rather than becoming a doctor is more popular, even though the risk uh, is higher. And then the third thing, culture. You say, you, you talk about the culture core. I think that's extremely interesting in your book. You said, the culture core that other countries are missing. A culture core is built on a rich stew of aggressiveness and team orientation on isolation and connectedness, and on being small and aiming big. And I think that's, um, that is key for us. We need to do the same. Uh, and the third one, established links. Your relationship to the United States, I think, is under-evaluated. I think how you capitalize on your networks, how you have become uh, this extrovert country. If you compare Norway, have lots of ideas, but your Maybe we have more ideas than Israel, but you're better in taking it out, so you're more an extrovert country than Norway. So, I think that was my time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.